All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. Um, and welcome to WGI's webinar today, uh, where we will be discussing the top 10 development considerations in San Antonio. Uh, we issued a white paper on this uh, earlier this year, so this is uh, kind of the live version of, of that document. Um, so just as a future resource, uh, we do have that, um, as well as this presentation that will be available afterwards for future reference. So um, if you jump to the next slide, uh, today uh, we are going to be going over um, the 10 most common uh, considerations when uh, going through a land development project here in San Antonio. Um, these are the, the 10 factors that uh, we always look to first uh, when we're getting uh, involved in a project or doing due diligence for a project. Uh, so we'll be walking you all through uh, what those look like, uh, what kinds of questions to be asking, and what type of implications uh, some of those items might have on uh, a project you'd be looking at doing in the San Antonio area. Uh, most of these, there's always a, a solution to get to. Um, it's just a matter of time and cost to get there, and so certainly something to be aware of uh, earlier rather than later uh, to make sure you can be as successful as possible. Uh, we hope that this is uh, a good resource for, for everyone who's looking at uh, any types of these projects um, uh, here in the area. Um, and then just as a, as a caveat, um, you know, all of these are going to be focused predominantly on the city of San Antonio, but um, our office uh, here locally does work in all of the adjacent municipalities around the San Antonio area, and there are um, variances to, to each of these topics in each of those municipalities that we're happy to talk with uh, anyone who would be interested in those um, outside of this presentation. Uh, so today, uh, you've got myself, uh, Taylor Allen. I'm a licensed engineer here in the state of Texas, uh, based in our San Antonio office. Um, and I've been working with uh, WGI in the Central Texas area for um, about the last decade. Uh, graduate from A&M, but a San Antonio native. So um, uh, always excited to, to see projects uh, impacting uh, this area. Um, also, my co-host today is Amanda. All right, thanks guys for joining us. Uh, yeah, like Taylor said, my name is Amanda Balfour. I am a uh, project manager here in our San Antonio office. Um, been here for a couple of years now with uh, Taylor, but I too am also a San Antonio native. Um, so excited to um, go through these um, topics with you guys, especially since, you know, you're, you're talking to the experts here, especially uh, specifically with San Antonio. <laughs> Uh, and a little bit about WGI. Um, as I mentioned, Amanda, I'm both uh, based in our San Antonio office, but we do have uh, physical offices across the country um, and uh, performing multiple uh, disciplines outside of just civil engineering. Um, both of us are focused in civil uh, and specifically land development, but uh, we have professionals uh, who work in a gamut of uh, disciplines, uh, including public and municipal work, uh, structural MEP, uh, parking, planning, and design, uh, transportation and mobility, uh, survey, landscape architecture, uh, and I'm sure I'm, I'm leaving out a few, but uh, certainly a, a broad range of services that we're able to bring to fruition on projects um, wherever you might be. Um, so before we dive into uh, the, the meat of our presentation today, we've got a little poll for all of our uh, attendees just so we have a better idea of of who we're going to be talking to today. Um, so with that, we're going to throw up some questions uh, for y'all to uh, answer for us. Uh, so I can take a minute and, and respond. The first one is uh, what your professional involvement is in land development, um, kind of where you uh, maybe cross paths with the land development project. Um, and then the second question is uh, when, when you typically engage with a civil engineer um, uh, through, through the project as, as you're involved.
that just a few more moments for y'all to select that and we'll we'll close that one out. We promise it's anonymous, so <laughs> they'll be scared to answer. All right, so uh, like Taylor mentioned, our first question is, what is your professional involvement in land development? Uh, we have a, a majority is uh, architects, engineers, and contractors on the call, at least those who have uh, participated. Um, so we've got uh, at least those three uh, parties um, for land development involved. Um, we also have an NA, uh, which is, you know, that doesn't fall in these categories of architect, engineer, contractor, landowner, land broker, finance, or developer. So that's exciting, something different. All right, and then uh, second question was, when do you typically engage with the civil engineer? And uh, a majority, that's 80%, oh, they've um, answered before uh, they put the land under contract. So. That was the majority of the answer. And we have one from the rest of the categories, one vote for each. Um, uh, after I've already owned land and am prepared to develop, uh, COSA Development Services or utility company. <laughs> and uh, never, I don't know what a civil engineer does. So. All right. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be spreading some good knowledge today. Uh, but that, good to know that uh, uh, the majority of folks um, uh, reach out early, uh, it helps us uh, be a better resource and I think certainly helps uh, project function better there if we can get involved. So good to know. Thank y'all for participating. And with that, we will get started. <laughs> All right, so the first topic is uh, land use and zoning. Um, this is uh, implemented by the city of San Antonio. Um, the county does not um, uh, implement or regulate this. Um, and so if you are in the ETJ of San Antonio or fully within a county, um, then, then these don't apply. But uh, for the vast majority of projects in the San Antonio area, uh, your base zoning is going to dictate uh, a number of things about your site. Um, uh, lot size requirements, uh, any setbacks associated with it, um, not only about your base zoning, but uh, depending on any adjacent properties that you might be uh, next to. So um, uh, there's a, additional buffers when you're uh, abutting uh, single-family residential or other residential uses that, that need to be taken into consideration. Um, zoning is also going to dictate building heights um, in certain parts of the city, which we'll, we'll talk about a little later. Uh, there may be impervious cover uh, limitations. Um, density on residential, so both multifamily and single family is going to be defined by your zoning. Um, and outside of our, our primary zonings, which you know would be pretty similar to, to many jurisdictions you might have worked in, uh, San Antonio does have uh, two relatively unique uh, zoning districts, one being infill development zone, IDZ, and MXD, which is for mixed use development. Um, the tables on the screen are a snapshot of some of the um, uh, items that IDZ permits, there's three different phases of IDZ 1, 2, and 3, uh, which is refined uh, in initial version of um, the IDZ zoning ordinance. Um, and what each of these both provide are some additional flexibility to uh, the base zoning districts that the city has um, and are more commonly used uh, in uh, urban, uh, denser uh, developments where, where our traditional zoning uh, may not be as applicable or uh, meet the intent of um, those those parts of the city. Um, and so each of these, as I mentioned, um, provides some flexibility on parking, heights, densities, um, and specifically with IDZ, uh, your minimum lot size. Uh, so each of these are, are really unique tools that, that allow uh, certain projects to be more successful um, uh, that otherwise may be challenging with, with our base zonings. Uh, the next topic is uh, environmental requirements. Um, so there's really kind of two categories that, that we look at, uh, one being uh, natural conditions. Uh, so in the north part of San Antonio, 
um, there's a high likelihood, uh, particularly when you're dealing with uh, areas with limestone, uh, that we're going to find uh, caves or karst features, uh, and commonly within those, there's a chance for certain types of species, including salamanders and spiders, that need to be um, uh, considered. Uh, those are usually uh, identified early on in a project uh, through uh, site testing, uh, but can sometimes uh, pop up during construction in areas that, that may not have had uh, soil testing completed. Um, San Antonio also has a very robust tree ordinance uh, that both protects um, existing trees of certain sizes, so 24 inches and above are going to be classified as a heritage tree, and there's increased protections around preserving those, uh, as well as uh, planting um, and tree canopy um, post-construction to help to increase the tree canopy across the city. Um, there are variances that are permitted um, in certain instances, um, but not always guaranteed, and certainly on a case-by-case -case basis uh, to help with certain site constraints that uh, may otherwise uh, limit a site from being developed due to, due to trees. Um, outside of natural conditions, there's um, built or historic issues that uh, a site may have. Um, so if you're in an area that has a sensitive watershed, any, any new construction may uh, trigger the need for water quality treatment. So as I mentioned, parts of the city on the north side uh, where limestone is prevalent um, uh, aligns with the Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone, uh, where the city of uh, San Antonio gets most of its drinking water from. And so uh, that's regulated through the state, through TCEQ, uh, for water quality uh, mitigation for runoff. Um, the city of San Antonio um, has limited uh, water quality requirements, um, and at this time uh, is, is processed through San Antonio River Authority for any properties that immediately abut the San Antonio River. Um, as an aside to that, there are incentives through San Antonio River Authority for folks wanting to implement um, water quality uh, mitigation on sites that aren't obligated to do it. Um, so something to consider if, if that's something you'd like to incorporate into a project. Um, another topic of environmental uh, concern is any historically significant um, items within a property. Um, some of those may be visible uh, structures above ground, but there's also um, things below grade that, that have to be looked at. Sometimes it's uh, foundations um, or walls from uh, historic development um, or safety is in, in that particular topic of historic significance. We'll, we'll dive in a little deeper uh, further on in the presentation. All right, uh, next topic is uh, stormwater drainage and floodplain. So, um, in my few years of experience in this industry, I can confirm that drainage definitely has an impact on every development. Um, drainage should be and is, it's number three, high on the list of concerns um, as what we want to, um, high, high on the list of concerns for every development because not only do we want to make sure that our um, site itself is, uh, does not flood, but we also want to prevent any downstream flooding um, that would possibly impact um, any, any development downstream from us. Um, so there's a couple of items that you we definitely look at uh, first off um, when it comes to uh, taking a look at our site and our proposed development. Um, for example, uh, any storage requirements, the city of San Antonio has um, existing infrastructure, public infrastructure uh, that um, accepts stormwater runoff from our development. We want to assure that if we are uh, connecting to that infrastructure that there is capacity and um, there's availability for our um, site to connect to. If not, um, potentially some improvements would, may need to be required. Um, and then of course, like all, for all drainage, we want to identify um, those outfall locations of where we're um, discharging our site from, um, whether it is, like I mentioned, underground infrastructure or um, uh, existing floodplain or um, just right onto some uh, public right of way. So we want to identify that. Um, there are some possible on-site and regional solutions. One of the things I'd like to I help identify early on is your site may be included in a regional master plan um, where uh, drainage and the desi and design has been considered um, for an overall large area, uh, large master plan uh, that your site may be located in. So 
uh, that could help a lot, answer a lot of questions early on in your project. Um, so looking for that and, and making sure if you're included in that um, can help. Um, like Taylor mentioned before, on environmental aspects, uh, stormwater is also involved in our water quality treatment. Uh, we do have um, structures, um, many types of structures that can be uh, built on site to treat uh, the treat the runoff from our development. Um, and so in most cases in San Antonio, um, if you're located within the Edwards Aquifer, uh, it is required of your site to treat that water that um, that is resulted from your development. However, um, you know sometimes if you're along the uh, Riverwalk, um, you may be required to do some additional water quality. Um, but that is all based uh, on location. Um, there is, is there might be a possibility that a flow plain is located within your within your site. Um, it does not mean to mean to run away from that uh, site itself. It's, an, it's not uh, necessarily a bad thing. It's just uh, an additional consideration to take to take in when it comes to uh, site planning and. Um, and just the overall development of the project and what can be uh, installed with that, uh, within that floodplain. Um, we've mentioned too uh, what can be allowed and prohibited. Um, uh, we definitely wouldn't, uh, we, we aren't allowed to have any habitable structures within the um, uh, floodplain. However, uh, working with the city of San Antonio, they could allow uh, paving and parking within uh, floodplains. So that, that could help um, identify um, where you'd want those parking or paving or driveways um, within that floodplain area. Um, and then of course, just a reminder recently, uh, the city of San Antonio has released um, their uh, revised uh, intensities um, and for Atlas 14. Um, they are uh, geographically determined and based so uh, when we do, uh, whether it's size our um, internal uh, drainage system, um, we, we make sure to use these um, intensities as they are higher than um, historical information. Um, so as mentioned, if, if, we, if you do have floodplain within your site, um, it's possible that you may have um, make improvements within it. Uh, within the floodplain, or you might want to um, um, readjust the floodplain limits within your site, which ultimately will would require uh, a Clomar. Um, in the city of San Antonio, um, we work with uh, both the city and FARA. FARA acts as um, an agent on behalf of FEMA um, to get a, a Clomar permit processed. Um, so. It, it might be different in um, other jurisdictions, but at least in the city of San Antonio, we work um, directly with the city and Sarah, uh, with the city of San Antonio and Sarah. Um, and last but not least, it's, it's, um, it can be rare, but um, we have waterways that can be determined um, as waters of the U.S. And with that, if that is adjacent to your site or maybe located within your site, um, that would require coordination with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, one of the important things to know about the Army Corps is that it's a federal agency, which usually requires um, separate coordination and longer review times, uh, which may affect your schedule. So that's very important to keep in mind. All right, uh, next we have utility entitlements. Um, utilities are an ess essential concern for any new development, um, not only assuring that utilities are physically adjacent to your development uh, to directly connect to, um, but we, it's also important to understand and confirm that the capacity uh, for both water and sewer service is available to your site. Um, most developments within the city of San Antonio are served by San Antonio water systems, which is PAUSE. Um, and, uh, just something to know, the city city limits don't necessarily define the service area um, of SAWS, but they overlap quite closely. So um, it's always good to know early on um, who your uh, service provider is for both water and so, uh, sewer. 
uh, it may be possible that SOS only provides um, one of them while another um, municipality or uh, entity uh, provides the other utility. Um, so very important to know, uh, like I mentioned, it is not only is, is there um, utilities directly adjacent, we want to make sure that there is capacity for the system um, for both water and sewer. Uh, and sewer. For water, um, there, in, case, in, in the case that there is not adequate uh, capacity, potentially an offsite and extension uh, might be necessary, or you need to uh, increase the size of the existing main um, adjacent to your property. It's, um, there, there are several solutions that can be um, identified by SAWS um, to help um, understand what kind of improvements would be required of your site. And same goes for um, sewer or wastewater. Um, if the existing um, infrastructure does not have capacity, uh, an off-site extension is also can also be possible, um, or potentially a lift station might be able to be uh, installed. Uh, just if you are restricted um, in um, with gravity. Um, so one thing I also want to mention, because I have had uh, quite a bit of experience, is um, in case uh, there it's not sewer service is not available to your site, on-site treatment can, could be considered. Um, um, and it is because in a case, it just may be more feasible cost-wise to do um, on-site treatment. And with that, you would um, permit through, the, through Bear County. Um, they are um, the municipality that will uh, review and approve um, any on-site treatment that you decide to move forward. All right, uh, the next item is electric service, uh, which is uh, somewhat of a subset of the utility entitlement that Amanda was talking about, but uh, in, in this case, uh, certainly warrants um, its own section. Um, San Antonio is uh, served exclusively by CPS Energy uh, for both electric and gas. And so uh, any new services um, uh, coming online go through uh, their department and certainly um, are a critical path of all, all land development projects. Um, CPS is an entity that we recommend getting in front of as early as possible in a project, mainly because there's a lot of moving pieces within their design and something to make sure that they have as much time up front, uh, not only both uh, for design, but for um, the actual implementation, construction, and uh, the materials associated with that. Um, CPS Energy is involved at the plotting phase, uh, which is one of the first things we typically do with the project. And it's important to understand the implications of easements that they're going to be requesting through the plotting process. Uh, the standard request is going to be a 14-foot easement off of all uh, property frontages, uh, whether there's utility poles there or not. And so I know sometimes you're looking at a site and you don't see any poles uh, on your property. And so you think that you can build right up to the property line and uh, Sometimes your zoning doesn't allow that, um, but even if it does, uh, CPS may um, be a, uh, a barrier to, to fully developing a site, particularly in urban areas. And so understanding that that's going to be an initial request um, from that entity through the entitlement process is, is important to know. Uh, we do uh, negotiate with them on uh, reducing or removing those easements wherever possible. Um, and a lot of that comes into play and in review with their distribution and planning departments, which um, have much uh, more in-depth and long-term planning of infrastructure needs. And so they're able to, to understand uh, whether or not future infrastructure is going to be needed within specific corridors, uh, which gives us some flexibility on uh, either reducing or removing easements um, on, on sites during the planning process. Um, we like to try and schedule what's called a UPPR meeting, which is essentially a preliminary plan review uh, with CPS as early as possible. Uh, once we have a preliminary site plan or understanding of the needs of the site from an electric load uh, is when we try and get in front of uh, their design team uh, for a number of reasons. One, to, to put it on their radar to know that it's a, it's a project that's going to be coming up in their queue. 
uh, for us to understand what their current uh, backlog and timelines look like uh, to integrate into an overall project schedule, um, and then to get their um, uh, take to make sure that there's not going to be any offsite improvements required, which um, is rare, but occasionally, uh, particularly on, on uh, higher density projects that may be requiring more power than what uh, the current infrastructure adjacent to the site may, may provide. Um, in addition to the easements that come up during plotting uh, based on a final design from CPS, uh, there are typically going to be easements required uh, throughout your property, particularly in a, in a multifamily or a larger commercial development where there's going to be CPS infrastructure running through a property uh, before it gets to a final transform or a meter at a building. And so we work closely with uh, CPS designers to make sure that those easements are um, uh, as efficiently routed as possible uh, and not incurring any encroachments with uh, proposed improvements across the site. Um, it is common, however, that we go through encroachment uh, agreements with SAWS, or I'm sorry, with CPS um, for things like signs, fences, um, light poles uh, that, that are allowed to be within their easements in most cases. Um, but still require uh, an encroachment agreement process to uh, make sure everyone's aware of, of uh, what's encroaching an easement and, and that those are at risk for being disturbed to CPS ever um, And then just as a, a, an additional note, um, CPS, like many um, suppliers and, and folks in the building industry are experiencing supply chain issues, uh, something that they're monitoring closely. Um, and providing uh, you know, weekly and monthly updates to um, the design and construction community on products that are in short supply or things that they're running low on that can have impacts on schedules and energize uh, dates to get buildings or homes um, fully up and running. Um, they're certainly all over it, uh, but just something to, to consider and something that we're monitoring with all of our projects that are approaching construction to make sure that we're not uh, needing to find alternative design solutions to uh, use what is available or um, to at least reorganize schedules if necessary. So just something to, to be aware of on that front. All right, next on the list, we have uh, traffic impacts and uh, roadway improvements. Right, so um, traffic is another significant concern um, for every site. Um, it it di directly impacts um, businesses and residents in the adjacent community um, of, the, of the proposed development. Um, it's important to understand how the development directly impacts um, existing roadways and infrastructure. Um, and so based on the site's impact, uh, potential changes or improvements to the roadways may be needed to offset um, the increase of traffic and uh, peak hour trips resulting in the development. Um, as you can see in the uh, photo to the right, um, this is the city's um, deter table and determination for us to determine peak hour trips from your development uh, based on land use. Um, and uh, specifically to the city of San Antonio, their threshold um, for peak hour trips is uh, 72, um, it, or sorry, 76. Is that one. Um, so if your development um, results in greater than 76 peak hour trips, or 10% increase from its previous uh, previous use, um, it, you, uh, your development will be required to complete a traffic impact analysis or a study. Um, this study is determined to pretty much, um, it, it anticipates the impact um, from your development and how what we can do to help mitigate those impacts. Um, and so, um, before before we uh, get kicked off completely on the traffic impact analysis, we meet with uh, the city's transportation department um, and potentially their public works uh, department as well. And we sit down for a scoping meeting to help um, identify the um, uh, adjacent areas and uh, intersections that uh, they want us to study to help identify um, uh, help identify which areas would be um, impacted the most. Um, it, could, it is possible, depending on the right-of-way that your site is directly adjacent to or obtaining access from, uh, it could be potentially a county road or a tech start road. So within that scoping meeting, we like to also include not only the city, but their county and um, tech start 
if needed. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, you get kicked off completely on this analysis. You want to make sure everybody's on, in agreement on um, the their concerns, and uh, we can make sure that we identify those in the report. Um, so, for impact fees, um, specifically the traffic. Um, the city of San Antonio does not necessarily um, impose a roadway impact fee. Um, the city uses a policy called rough proportionality. Um, so this helps because uh, because um, the city, through rough proportionality, um, it, the city determines the maximum value of the development and is obligated to pay to cover uh, the mitigation required. Um, it's intended to ensure that uh, required improvement, the required improvements from development are reasonably related and roughly proportionate to the estimated impact um, of the project. Um, and some of these uh, mitigations or solutions uh, to mitigation um, include something like new traffic signals or uh, dedicated turn lanes. Um, and so that the cost of these solutions um, are identified and calculated as uh, part of their rough, of the project's rough proportionality. Um, so to give you an example, it's just if, if the project warrants a um, new signal, um, well, and the signal costs, you know, 200K, um, but the based on your rough proportionality of your specific project, the maximum uh, value that could be asked of your project is 100K. That would 100K would be a uh, maximum that you can contribute toward that group. Um, All right. Uh, most of the items we talked about so far are reviewed uh, administratively with uh, review staff uh, at the city or county or TxDOT. Um, there are a number of instances, however, that there is required uh, neighborhood or um, public uh, components for decision making to happen. And uh, this one, I think, is probably um, one of the ones to be most aware of, only because there's so many different stakeholders and variables that can impact decisions. Uh, and so the, the cases in which there's a, a public setting um, for decision making um, in San Antonio or, or anything that has um, a historical component, uh, whether it's historically designated um, through zoning, if it's in a neighborhood conservation district, uh, components that would require to go through uh, historic design commission HDRC. Um, and so there's a number of boards and commissions that uh, development project um, has potential to go through, HDRC being one of them uh, that I just mentioned for um, it's pre predominantly architecturally uh, design driven, um, but any plan amendments or zoning changes that uh, a site would need to, to get the land use that uh, a, a ultimate project would need uh, goes through those public uh, sessions. And so it's very important to understand if your project is, is going to cycle through a public hearing process, and if so, to engage with that process um, as early as possible. Uh, and so what we recommend when going through these is identifying who the stakeholders are that have an input um, into the process. And so most commonly that's going to be uh, adjacent landowners, whether that's um, a single property owner or uh, a neighborhood uh, uh, property owners association um, and notifying them in advance. Any public hearing is going to have uh, city distributed notifications, um, but we have found that uh, proactively reaching out to those stakeholders uh, ahead of time helps uh, relieve some of the uh, stress that uh, neighbors can get when they just get a uh, an unsolicited notice from the city that something might be changing uh, nearby to them. So we recommend reaching out to those folks as early as possible, uh, reaching out to council uh, district and their staff. Um, all of the commissions that these public hearings process through uh, are led by commissioners that are appointed by their respective uh, council person. And so understanding what, A, what council districts you're in, um, and then what their expectations are for projects being developed within their district. Um, each one of them has um, varying degrees of 
um, process that they like to see and um, certain processes that they, that they like to uh, go through outside of the standard commission hearing. And so understanding what those uh, uh, expectations look like based on the district you're in um, can really help uh, make some of those processes a little bit smoother. Um, and as a note to that, the city of San Antonio did just approve uh, a redistrict redistricting so, uh, have shifted around um, as of this month and so uh, council representation may may have shifted for properties that you might be uh, currently uh, working in right next on the list we have um, parking um, as many of you know parking is definitely something that um, should always be considered for a new development. Um, not only to just make sure that we're following the requirements set by the code, but um, we want to assure that, you know, you're providing adequate parking for whether it's your tenants or customers or, you know, whoever will be using um, the development uh, once it's all, once it's done and complete. Um, so uh, depending on um, our, the jurisdiction that you're in, um, there may be a minimum and a maximum uh, parking requirement set. Um, and it's usually set by uh, land use, depending on what you're intending to build uh, within your site. Um, and so, which can be uh, determined. Uh, the photo you see on the right is, um, is uh, our calculations uh, based on the city of San Antonio's um, code to determine your minimum and maximum uh, parking. So, um, in, in addition to just standard parking, um, there are uh, additional um, parking requirements um, that could be included within your site. Um, some of these requirements could be maybe screening measures uh, because you know you're within a certain uh, maybe historic zone or um, some some other uh, specific area that requires it. Um, you can also have maybe parking for electric vehicles. Um, you know, in this um, day and age, we're seeing uh, charging stations pop up, so that could be a requirement, um, depending on, on your site. Um, and then, of course, we're also um, providing ADA accessible uh, parking spots and routes uh, within your parking lot, and then even uh, bicycle parking. So those are some additional uh, requirements to take in, into uh, consideration. Um, and so, in addition, it's not unusual that uh, we have parking reductions or parking reductions could be uh, potentially available to your site. Uh, and it's mostly geographically based. Um, and for example, like some of these listed, um, if you're within our the city's urban core and potentially you're zoned um, IDZ, uh, that zoning allows for uh, a reduction in parking. Um, and so uh, it may be possible that your site that you've purchased um, has a parking agreement uh, for an adjacent property so that you all can share um, uh, parking in order to meet the, the minimum um, for your site. That's, that's another, another uh, potential uh, reduction that you can consider. And then of course, uh, we also have comp compact parking is available. Um, but um, it should, I mean, it's, a, it's another uh, solution um, if you're uh, working with, you know, especially, like I said, in our urban core and in our infill site. Oh, one thing I also want to mention, this is uh, what I went over is specifically in the city of San Antonio. Um, if your site is located within the city's ETJ, um, the, uh, the uh, Bear County um, does not have any parking requirements, or they do not enforce parking requirements. So that's something um, to keep in mind. All right. The next step is historic preservation, which um, is uh, certainly unique to San Antonio um, and something that uh, can be a critical part of a, a successful development uh, within San Antonio. Um, so there's a, a number of different uh, historic components that can impact a site. Um, the most obvious one being a historic structure on site, uh, which you can see um, you know, from the street day one and uh, understand that there might be an implication of that. Um, 
that would be a situation where, again, as I mentioned previously, uh, uh, probably going through HDRC for design reviews uh, to make any modifications to uh, an existing uh, historic structure. Um, however, there's a number of uh, historic elements that you may not be able to see uh, from, a, from the ground day one, and we've I think we've seen just about all of them, um, but some of those include um, historic walls or foundations from buildings or structures that um, have been covered up with um, development or uh, just the growth of the city over time, um, and acequias, which um, are um, run north to south uh, through the downtown of San Antonio and were used by Spanish settlers to uh, convey water through um, the region um, as it was an agricultural based community for, for many years. And so those are components that have to be um, identified early. Um, any project that's uh, being proposed within um, the, the downtown area or adjacent to any of the creeks or rivers um, through San Antonio um, will have a requirement to go through an archaeologic study at the time of platting or, or building permit where um, between staff and an archaeologist can determine if there's any potential for one of those features to be on, on site. Uh, that typically results in some field exploration, a few backhoe trenches in targeted areas um, to try and identify whether or not those features exist on the site or not. Uh, oftentimes we don't find anything uh, during that testing, but potentially something comes up during construction and then a part of the site that wasn't studied initially. Um, and those are going to be situations that have to be um, responded to and designed around sometimes um, uh, in the middle of construction if it, if it was an area of the site that wasn't uh, previously studied. Um, the City of San Antonio um, Office of Historic Preservation um, uh, has a number of different ways that they accept mitigation around uh, some of those features, whether it be uh, documentation within the building or design of the building to sort of uh, identify maybe what was there previously. Um, there are instances uh, when there is federal funding involved in a project and where we see that most commonly in land development is something like HUD financing on a multifamily project where that now triggers um, a state level review of any historic um, or antiquities uh, found within a property. And the ability to disturb some of those improvements um, becomes a much more rigid process um, and so mitigating those um, can be a little bit more challenging and sometimes uh, cause more significant um, adjustments to a proposed site or development to accommodate those, those features. And so um, most projects, when we're dealing directly with the city, we have some flexibility to, to come up with some creative solutions um, to identify and, and mitigate those, those features um, and document them appropriately. Um, but when we get into that, that um, HUD financing or federal dollars that have the state level uh, where impacting those features becomes less and less um, uh, of an option. Um, we've, we've gone through those processes as well and, and are happy to, to discuss that on a case-by-case -case basis of, of what solutions might look like to be able to accommodate both um, those historic features as well as uh, new development um, in those areas. Next, we have uh, impact fees. Um, so as many of you know, uh, we, we uh, deal with almost every site deals with impact fees. Um, many of people uh, outside of San Antonio may call uh, water and sewer impact fees, um, capping fees or, or meter fees, they're all uh, related. Um, but if you've ever uh, developed in the city of San Antonio, uh, you and your site may have fell victim uh, to the SOS impact fees, um, but um, these impact fees are normally paid uh, right before, um, you know, you're ready to connect um, to each utility in the field. Um, however, uh, based on their size, uh, these fees should be considered and identified early on in the project. Um, because they, because of their large dollar amount. Um, uh, most, both water and sewer fees, um, specific to SAWS, as well as um, other fees, um, they vary uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, but they um, all usually represent, you know, um, like for example, water and sewer is service to the site. 
or whether it's like stormwater to the site. Um, so something to note is uh, that specifically for SAWS, um, the rate of impact fees is um, based on uh, location within the city. So they've identified uh, certain pressure areas and um, uh, certain uh, wastewater treatment areas um, around San Antonio, which will help identify um, the rate that your site will be paying on behalf of um, their, their uh, impact fees and their service fees. Um, so for example, um, I have a multifamily site. It's about 330 units. Um, say it's located in the uh, middle, uh, the middle pressure elevation zone, and then it's also uh, served by SAW's um, upper collection um, wastewater treatment. Um, impact, impact fees for that specific site could sit around um, 850K for water impact fees and then about 1 million for sewer impact fees. So that kind of gives you like a range of depending, depending on what kind of development you're working with. But um, I wasn't kidding when we said it's, it's a big number and I think it's something that we should definitely identify early on in the project, even when they're normally uh, paid you know, right in, during construction, right when we're ready to make this, make these connections, as you see in the photo behind us. Um, so, in addition to uh, SAW's impact fees, um, there's some other fees to take into consideration, um, like our tree removal mitigation fee uh, that's paid to the city of San Antonio for any uh, removal of protected or heritage trees that are located on site. Um, and then we also have, um, not listed here, but we also have a fee in lieu of parkland dedication. Um, that's another fee that's paid to the city of San Antonio. Um, and then, uh, as, as I had mentioned um, in our stormwater section before, we also have a fee in lieu of uh, detention, which is also paid to the city of San Antonio. Uh, that fee is based on the increase of impervious cover um, that your site will bring, um, you know, once the development is complete. Um, and so, you know, in many, something to note, in many of our infill sites located in our urban core, maybe it has an existing parking lot or development that, you know, they're, they're redoing um, the improvements that are on site. Uh, it may be possible that you're not actually increasing impervious cover, you might be decreasing. In that case, it's um, possible that um, your philo fee or fee in lieu of detention fee uh, could, be, uh, uh, could be zero. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. Um, so these fees, like I said, could easily sneak up on you. And these, uh, we want to identify these soft costs uh, early on in the schedule so that they can be included in the development plan and most importantly the budgeting the budgeting because really that's that's what it what it's all about. All right. So we've got our five rules of land development. Uh, just wanted to end end our uh, presentation with some rules that we live by in the land development world. Um, first and foremost, uh, uh, number one is, you know, always check your email and voicemail. Um, for Taylor and I, we um, have customer service and um, client satisfaction is absolutely the most important thing in our day-to-day uh, -day lives. Our, um, and so we just want to make sure um, that something, uh, making sure that we're providing um, updates and responses to our clients uh, is definitely important to us. So that's what number one. Uh, number two, what must go up uh, must come down, uh, both in uh, markets but also gravity. A lot of uh, the utilities we work with are gravity, and we have less wiggle room on some of those. So always something we're uh, having to check. Uh, number three is we must add value to the deal. Um, of course, we're oh, excuse me. We're here to um, to make sure the deal that you guys are getting into is uh, the best option for you. Um, we are here to provide insight, insight ahead of making any uh, big decisions. We want to identify those uh, 
possible, uh, maybe inevitable, inevitable bumps in the road um, before you know you guys agree to move forward with the project and nobody likes the crisis. Uh, number four, relationships matter. Um, I think uh, this is particularly true in a place like San Antonio that's um, a very large municipality, but sometimes feels like a very small town. And uh, we always want to be uh, a trusted advisor. Um, uh, for you on uh, both projects we're working on and, and opportunities you might be pursuing down the road. Um, and last but not least, uh, there's no crying in land development, um, despite whatever anybody has told you. I, <laughs> there's no crying. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that concludes our presentation. Yeah, um, uh, here's our, our contact information. I hope that today was uh, helpful and resourceful and hopefully you learned a little something that maybe you didn't know before. Um, if there's um, any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us or pop them in the chat. We can stick around for a few minutes. I know we're coming up on time, um, but would be happy to answer any, any questions that y'all might have now. But again, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, this presentation, um, along with the white paper, will be available uh, afterwards. You should be getting um, an email um, sometime later this week with a, a copy of that for future reference um, to, to go back and, and check on. But um, again, don't hesitate to reach out to either one of us um, with any questions you might have had on either today's presentation or any, any future sites you might be uh, looking at that we can be of help on. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks for your time. Thanks. I have a good afternoon.